Here's an idea. Magic the Gathering is the jazz of card games. Kinda. I've received lots of requests over the years to do episodes on particular topics, and one request that I've received a lot is for Magic, the card game, not like the mind freaks. I've hesitated because magic is complicated, and while I used to play it a lot, I don't anymore. Though, fun fact, the deck that I used when I was a kid is literally on the set. I think I probably thought that this apocalypse card was just, like, super cool. It's got a dude and a robe on it. So, I'm out of practice, but after some research and tons of help from Patrick, Idea Channel's consulting producer, we've put together an idea about magic, and it has to do with jazz. You like jazz? If you're familiar with either, I want to be clear, we're painting with a really broad brush here. Both magic and jazz are huge subjects that are difficult to summarize in any amount of time, let alone a 15 minute video. So just go easy on me with the well actuallys. And if you're familiar with both, you're probably thinking, okay, here we go. Magic is like jazz because improvisation and Yes, but also we're gonna get beyond that idea. What we're gonna try to do is use each to explain the other in an effort to understand some similarities and one big difference in how they both work as systems. However, first, we gotta cover some ground for those who don't know their chromatic scales from their chromatic lanterns. Magic the Gathering is a card game invented in 1993 by Richard Garfield. Magic combines high fantasy fireballs and goblins with the distribution model of baseball cards. Players purchase randomized booster packs, never knowing whether the contents will complete their collection or be their 15th copy of a Bill Tuttle or Big Turtle. This model, the collectible card game, has become the basis for countless imitators. Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Hearthstone. There are even collectible card games like Gwent and Triple Triad inside other games. Magic is usually played head to head with two players. Each player brings their own deck, unlike Uno or poker, and all of the 16,000 plus unique cards in Magic do something different. Some cards draw you more cards, some cards damage your opponent, and some cards assemble contraptions. I am told that that is a joke for Magic players. Herein lies the most interesting part of Magic. Each player is also a deck builder, a strategist who gets to assemble their own 60 card stack of tactics and expressions which they pull from in the heat of battle. Maybe you're starting to see jazz on the horizon. Before we get there though, it's worth pointing out that Magic is also unbelievably complex. 16,000 cards all doing different things means that the comprehensive rule set runs to 211 pages and includes sentences like 301.5C. An equipment that's also a creature can't equip a creature. An equipment that loses the subtype equipment can't equip a creature. An equipment can't equip itself. An equipment that equips an illegal or non-existent permanent becomes unattached from that permanent but remains on the battlefield. This is a state-based action. See rule 704. Despite, though, or perhaps because of its complexity, magic is wildly popular. And while it's not as culturally visible as Dungeons and Dragons, the go-to marker of unrepentant nerddom in things like the Big Bang Theory, Freaks and Geeks, or Stranger Things, it still sells millions of cards in a year in 11 different languages to more than 75 countries. So magic isn't just a nerdy gaming hobby. It's also a component of what theorist and critic Theodore Adorno termed the culture industry. Adorno used this term to describe a problem he saw with the industrialized production of culture, that we use assembly lines to create functional things like vacuum cleaners or pipe cleaners or runway cleaners, but that also we do that with expressive things like books and paintings and music. This, to him, was bad and gross. Chief amongst Adorno's related worries is one about standardization. Once cultural objects are mass produced, they lose their authenticity or expressive quality, he thought. And hey, guess what he also thought was high church of culture industry standardization? Jazz, which when Adorno came to the States was dominating the pop charts. So here's Adorno, he's curmudgeonly, and he does not like jazz. He described it as essentially a multiple choice questionnaire, which quote, guarantees that regardless of what aberrations occur, the hit will lead back to the same familiar experience and nothing fundamentally novel will be introduced. Adorno's complete analysis of jazz as popular music isn't really worth diving into. It's based on some pretty inconsistent theories. It doesn't add up to much more than I don't like thing and plays into some pretty insidious racial subtext. So we're gonna chuck most of his complaints out and when I mention him, we're gonna play a jaunty jazz interlude in order to cleanse the palate. Now, Adorno 
was complaining about how standardization meant that nearly every pop song sounded exactly alike. And yes, that is a phenomenon that is still with us today. He'd claim that jazz's reputation as an improvisational form wasn't totally earned since the jazz he knew was based on standardized rules, which amount to bass repetition. If you're playing Autumn Leaves, you're gonna move from A7 to D7 every time, even if you're improvising in the meantime. But here's the counter argument. Far from limiting expression, those standard forms enable it and enable improvisation. Jazz forms are more like a playground than a prison. For instance, you may have heard about the changes, a chord progression associated with I Got Rhythm, which forms the basis of many nonetheless very improvised jazz pieces. This provides a standard framework for musicians to play within, around, between, and against, as long as everyone agrees what the baseline form and expectations are. Sitting down to play magic relies on a similar type of standardization. All of the cards have unambiguous functions and the rules of the game are determinate. Every magic player has to agree on exactly what Deathrite Shaman does, otherwise the game can't proceed. But even with standardized rules, there are still moments, like in the finals of the 2012 Pro Tour, when Yuya Watanabe thought seized himself in order to fuel his own Deathrite Shaman in the face of a turn zero ley line of sanctity, which I'm told was dope AF. These mind-blowing moments happen with virtuosic jazz improvisers too, where even within a seemingly strict framework, something weirdly unbelievable happens. I'll spare you the inside jazz baseball jargon, but you can tell when it happens because either on stage or uh, in the audience, someone makes this face. Remember though, we're not just talking about the act of playing magic or jazz in the moment. I mean, if we were, why not talk about all improvisational forms? Why not compare magic to freestyling or guitar solos? Well, because before any magic player sits down to improvise their way through a game, they decide on and assemble the score or a deck that they'll be using to do so. And what does it feel like to compose something that you know is gonna change significantly when you play it? In an interview in 1996 with jazz legend Ornette Coleman, he had this to say about his role as a jazz composer. Normally, I begin by composing something that I can have the musicians analyze. I play it with them, and then I give them the score. And at the next rehearsal, I ask them to show me what they've found, and we can go from there. So for Coleman, the act of composition is contingent and malleable. He composes relative to how things shake out when his players get together. The next closest analog is probably like a jam band, but arguably that's jazz improv just with longer hair and slightly different priorities. Anyway, this is exactly what happens every time Wizards of the Coast releases new cards into the wild. Players pick them up, incorporate them into new decks or decks they've been playing for years, and find out what they can do with them, a process that then feeds back into Magic's creation. So to counter Adorno's original point, Point. It might be that jazz and magic are capable of deep expression precisely because they are derived from standardized repeated components. As Coleman put it, jazz is the only music in which the same note can be played night after night, but differently each time. So this is the happy ending, the one where deck building is fun, jazz is fun, and Adorno was a stuffy jerk. High fives, let's put on some Monk and crack open a pack of Innistrad. Okay, not so fast, because the fact that magic and jazz aren't shackled, but freed by their standardization, that doesn't actually mean that those things aren't still part of the culture industry. Jazz was a huge influence on the formation of the American music industry and the culture of catchy radio-friendly verse, chorus, verse, chorus structures that has predominated for the last half a century. And similarly, the random baseball card pack mode of distribution that Magic helped make hip has now grown into the cornerstone of emerging digital game markets. You only need to watch a few opening 1000 Hearthstone packs videos or learn about the laws that regulate digital gashapon mechanics to realize that there's something potentially troubling about the business model Magic helped spawn. Richard Garfield himself has even begun publishing publishing warnings about this trend in games. He calls them Skinnerware, after the pigeon conditioning experiments of B.F. Skinner. But the marketing of these two cultural forms also points to one of the ways in which they are very, very different. One of the reasons that I didn't try to define jazz in this episode is because that umbrella is just too broad. Jazz can be the euphonious vocalizations of Ella Fitzgerald, but jazz can also be the honky scrunches of Evan Parker. Jazz is also known for being improvisational, but not all jazz is. The cultural definition of jazz is therefore centrifugal. What is considered jazz spins further and further ever outward until some people argue the word just loses all meaning. Magic, on the other hand, is centripetal, spinning inward. We mentioned the great number of games that it's inspired, but honestly, and most players will admit this, there's not a lot of difference between many of those games. Minions instead of creatures, energy instead of mana, charge instead of haste, and yet each one, no matter how similar to magic, is very intent on distinguishing itself, calling itself something else. But the force of magic's design is just hard to escape. So if we're talking real big picture here, magic is maybe closer to the blues of games? 
And jazz, if anything, maybe it's the chess of music, but at this point, our metaphors are stretching like Armstrong. Perhaps the idea that I really want to explain, culture, industry, and standardization aside, is that there's a particular pleasure in composing something you get to play in an unexpected way with other people. Whether it involves A minor 7th flat 5th chords or tiny slices of expensive cardboard. What do y'all think? Is magic the jazz of collectible card games? I'm also kind of curious about the opposite question, which we didn't really talk a lot about, which is whether jazz is the magic of improvisational formats. But man, we have not put together a framework for that question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Go at it anyways. Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding your content. That one will be published on Friday. We'll put a link in the doobly-doo when it's out. And if you happen to need more YAR content in your life, please go check out our friends over at Wisecrack. They released a video about the philosophy of Logan this week that is just chef kiss hand motion great. Uh, they tackle it through the lens of Westerns and show all of the ways that Logan sort of pays homage to uh, Western films. Uh, they go on to talk about Enclosure, which is, yeah, it's, you should just go watch it. It's dope. Uh, and while you're there, if you have a feeling too, you should hit a subscribe button, preferably theirs. We're going to be taking two weeks off, not this week, but the next week is VidCon. Hope to see you there. We're going to be doing a live Dungeons and Dragons game with some other PBS Digital Studios folks. And there will also be a PBS Digital Studios Nerd Night where I'm going to be talking about um, applause, where it comes from, what it means, how it works, why we do it, uh, and also booing. Should be pretty good. We have Facebook and IRC and a subreddit, and the tweets of the week come from one Matt Bernhardt, who made a supercut of every time I said content in last week's video. And just, I want to do a quick uh, shout out and uh, also um, rest in peace to all of the people in the comments from last week's video who said that they would do a shot every time I said content. And finally, Mr. Don't Try This himself, Adam Savage, who knows how to pronounce Jaif. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these prodigal sorcerers. 